because there's a confusion when people are looking at what they perceive as their life, their linear life in the world and the witnesses, and then they'll start digging inside saying, okay, what, what are my thoughts, what are my beliefs, what's going on here, why am I drawing forth that witness with my daughter, or so on and so forth. And to take it a little bit deeper, I just want to go back a few days. Um, we were down in the campground and we were in the dome several days ago and having a nice little chat, an evening chat, and uh, we were talking about different things and then suddenly Jeff brought up this story of uh, when the Jehovah Witnesses uh, visited him up in Canada and we didn't know, we were all in for a big belly laugh, uh, but he continued on in saying that the Jehovah's had come to him and they'd, they had talked about God and Jesus and everything, everything's going fine, you know, it's a nice encounter with him. Marike was actually uh, eavesdropping, listening on the whole conversation, and it got to the point where uh, the Jehovah's turned to Jeff and they said, they started talking about the devil, and they looked at him and they said, well, who created the devil? The Jehovah's asked him, and he said, I did. <laughs> and, and they got right up, they closed the books and left very quickly. Uh, and uh, Marike helped us capture that. She heard, heard the whole thing. She said, I heard you say, I did. <laughs> and they left very quickly. And, and that was kind of a funny moment that kind of, I was just praying this morning, I was thinking back to that little scene, and I thought, I thought, that's an interesting one, because when we start to, to try to find the source of, of upsetting perceptions, it's tempting to go back into your mind. And yet a deeper question was the questions that the Jehovah's were asking. Who, who created the devil? That was their question, you know. They were, they were in an intense conversation there. Who created the devil? And what I wanted to talk a little bit about today is, is that uh, the devil is causeless. The devil is causeless. The devil doesn't have a cause. And if you can start to follow me on this, and really follow me all the way, the divine metaphysics, you'll find you're going to be exceedingly happy <laughs> if you can follow me that the devil is causeless. Now the Course teaches that, that the ego projected, the ego made the world. God didn't create the linear world of time and space. That was back in Genesis, you know, God <laughs> created the heavens and the earth in seven days, and got tired, you know, he had to rest, you know, on Sunday, and there's a little bit of anthropomorphizing going on with, uh, with God there, but, you know, God did not create the world. God did not create perception. It's the ego that did. But if the, the devil or the ego is causeless, we could, we could then take the next step and say that the world, the perceptual world, is causeless. Isn't that wonderful? It doesn't have a cause. Wow, you can start to feel there's a healing vibe under there somewhere, if we could start to really get into the, what that means. The world is causeless. And, and notice how as you go through your life and you see things in the world, and you want to take it back and say, oh, what is this reflecting to me? What did I have to do with this daughter acting in that way, or with this thing happening to the body, or to this you know, sh mass shooting of the children, or, you know, a lot of the things that have been happening on the timeline recently. It's, it's very tempting to try to play the, the metaphysician, you know, now. What, how is that reflecting on me? And then you start to come back to the basic teaching that the world is causeless. The ego is causeless. The devil is causeless. God is cause. Uh, we could say that that really God is cause with a capital C. Cause, creator. And Christ, our very being, is an effect of that cause. And also simultaneous with it. That's what Jesus meant, Father and Son are one. But the cause and the effect are together in heaven. That's what he meant with I and the Father are one. And that this whole world is an attempt to see something other than that. Talk about make-believe, talk about fiction, talk about trying to manifest or make up something that doesn't even have a cause. That's what takes us into the healing. 
you can't heal what isn't real. So when we try to heal the body, when we try to heal the world, when we're trying to heal the linear timeline, it's trying to heal something that's not real. You think that will succeed? Do you think that you actually can heal something that isn't real? When the whole point of healing is to come back to reality, to start to recognize what reality is. So to me, that takes it so, so much deeper. It drops it way down from the sense of, not so much of looking and saying, what, what in my mind is producing this thing in the world, which still assumes that there's like this external world that's being caused by this internal state of mind, when the actual healing drops down even a step deeper than that. I always say, just like if you were watching dreams, instead of getting into dream interpretation, pay attention to the <coughs> feelings. And then when you get in touch with the feelings, it could be an anxiety, an insecurity, a fear, or whatever, that's your inroads into going inside with the Holy Spirit and seeing the impossibility of all of it. Not trying to focus on the specifics and try to work out the healing through the specifics. I think that's a helpful step. I, we were talking the other night about Louise Hay and You Can Heal Your Life and her books, how it starts off at the symptom level and then there's that tracing back and tracing back. But even that tracing back kind of relates to our very first question about how much do we have to, you know, or, or Claudia talking about how specific do I have to get or do I have to really get in touch with what's going on specifically you start to realize that, that forgiveness is kind of pulling the plug on the whole projection, on the whole ego, by getting back into the point where you start to see that, that there's really nothing that needs to be healed. That's where the, the true healing occurs. But as long as we, we keep looking for it in specifics, and even metaphysically we try to keep understanding how is this working? How is this connecting? It's still part of a very subtle, ingenious, sneaky game where we're still trying to kind of find our, our healing piecemeal. And, and actually, it will never work. So, thank you. I mean, that, that kind of launches us into explore this together. You know, explore the healing, ex explore the acceptance. Because exposure is just one part of it. I know sometimes people will say, when does the exposing end? When does the removal of the obstacles actually come to an end? There must be more to forgiveness than just exposure, than just exposing the thoughts and feelings and beliefs. There has to be a state of mind that's actually there, that was, that's what the healing is really about. And the exposure, we don't deny that it has its helpfulness, but it's pointing towards a realization that, that there is nothing to heal. We were talking about that the other day, there's really nothing to heal. How glorious that is.